I'm now going to be joined on stage by the moderator for this panel. I'm going to ask you to help me welcome in a moment Priyanka Matu. She's the founder, she's a co-founder of the podcasting media network Erios, we've heard about today, a filmmaker and a producer and a former agent. Priyanka, come on stage if you don't mind. What's up? What's up? <laughs> awesome. And our panelists, please help me welcome Lisa Davis. Sam Safer, and Vanessa Silverton Peel. What to expect when you're expecting to be famous. Thank you, ladies. Wow. Are you all good? Do we have just the right distance? <laughs> I'm like really concerned. bad at tech. Very detail oriented. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Priyanka Matu, the founder, co-founder of Erio's uh, Podcast Network. And before that, I was an agent and a producer. I also went to law school. Um, and now I write and direct. <laughs> so I've seen deal making from every angle. I'll be moderating this discussion about who to talk to, when to talk to them, and what you need to know about deal making so that you don't get taken for a ride. Um, and I want to start by asking each one of you to introduce yourselves and then explain just a bit about how and when you tend to get involved um, in the deal making process. So sure. we should can start with Lisa. Okay. So um, I am a lawyer, I'm a partner at of the New York and LA firm of Frankfurt, Kernick, Klein, and Sells. And I um, am an entertainment lawyer, so I work with creatives in every dimension. And I have a lot of clients that are podcasters and are doing deals with all of the usual suspects, the luminaries, the gimlets, um, crooked media, all of those. And so I'm dealing with rights issues, financing issues, um, deal issues um, on a daily basis. Sam? Hi, I'm Sam, uh, manager, producer. I've produced shows like Broad City and This Is Not Happening and Alternatino. Um, as a manager, we tend to get involved actually pre-deal, kind of more when the seeds are planted and to help nurture the idea and develop them out and then start figuring out who the right partners are. Um, and then we get involved in the deal, obviously, once the deal comes in, but it's a little bit more pre-deal. Uh, I'm Vanessa Silverton Peel. Um, I'm at CIA. I sit in our scripted television department. Um, I was a news producer, actually, for 10 years. Mm. Uh, came into CIA, um, actually, on our non-scripted side. And uh, just, I, I had been, actually, a radio producer in the very beginning of my career, and so loved podcasts. And through that love of podcasts, very early on, started signing podcasters and podcast companies. And since then, um, moved into our scripted television department to package those uh, podcasts, but also books and articles and you know, uh, stories that journalists have for scripted television. Um, and in terms of when I get involved, it really depends. Um, I like to be involved as early as possible um, to kind of take a producerial approach to how to help build the story making and figure out sort of what the right path is, um, whether it's television, film, or something else. And Sam, you said that you tend to get involved pre-deal. You are often the first one on the team. Yes. Um, so do you tend to, could you walk us through a little bit how you like seek out people who might be potential podcasters with ideas? Like what kind of things are you walking them through generally um, when developing their ideas? Like what are the kind of questions you come up against when you're representing new talent? Really, the question is, why are you doing this podcast, right? <laughs> like, why are you the person to tell this story? Because anybody can talk about, let's just say, food or, like, a murder that happened. Or anybody can have a funny conversation with someone. But why are you the right person to do it? And that, for me, is always the first question to really hone in on. Because I think you have to know what the core voice of the show is. And that, to me, is really led by the host or the creator. Um, and then from there, expanding on that and helping translate it to the buyer or making sure that you're finding the right partner for it because sometimes the things in your head seem very clear, but they get lost in translation and making sure that when you're pitching, when you're selling, when you're producing, that the thing that's in your head is actually being projected appropriately rather than like truly lost in translation because you think you like, you know, 
you're like, yeah, obviously, like, I like to bake, and, like, I went to culinary school, and blah, 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 but it's like, but nobody knows this about you, <laughs> so you have to tell them. Um, and just really helping to nurture things like that. And I think of a manager as, like, a very clear mirror mm -hmm. um, in terms of when you don't have a clear mirror on yourself, right? You have filters, you have all these perceptions about yourself or knowledge that you think goes without saying, but I think a manager is like a very clear mirror to reflect back what is clear and what is, what is not. So if we're walking through like assembling the team kind of chronologically, like when does an agent, or who, comes, who comes in next? An agent would come in next um, mm -hmm. and then a lawyer generally, but mm -hmm. there's a million different ways to do it. Um, a lot of agents are really hands-on and it's incredibly valuable and a lot of lawyers are pretty hands-on too. Lawyers tend to be a little bit less hands-on. Yeah. Um, it depends. It depends. I, I've, yeah, worked with, depends. I've worked with Lisa. Mm -hmm. A lot of hands, a lot of on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really depends, but I think like traditionally, I mean, the business is changing a lot, yeah. but you know, in the 80s, it was like manager first, then yeah. agent, then yeah. lawyer. That's I wouldn't get too hung up on that though, right. to tell you the truth. I, I really, but like, I would never worry about if you're joining, if, if you are working with people in the right order, right. find the right people. Find the people, your lawyer, your manager, your agent should treat you like an artist, mm -hmm. should treat you like a creator. They need to see the best in you because every call, every meeting, every email that is on your behalf has to be the best representation of you. So it's about those right partnerships. Um, rather than what order you do it in. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to jump in and echo that. And it depends on what the genesis of the idea is. A lot of my clients, they've already established some kind of following in another medium. Maybe they're bloggers, and then they decide to podcast. So in that instance, maybe they have the team already, but their manager doesn't know a lot about podcasts, so they say to me, okay, I'm, I'm gonna start a podcast company and I need the infrastructure. So it really depends on what you're doing and how big your ambition is. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a question for you guys. Where do you come in, like when you generally um, start to represent podcasters, are you at the conception stage of the idea or are you like, are you brought in when, when people already have an idea and they're like, we have a listenership and now we need to turn it into something else? Like what do you mostly see day to day? So I think it depends, again. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's usually, um, bef it's, it's after they have the idea, mm -hmm. because I think, as Sam said, that's when a manager is really helping you hone and clarify what that idea so kind is. Kind of like a public figure but, with an idea. Um, but just to piggyback on what I heard Juleka talking about um, as we were waiting to come on stage, you know, one of the things that's key is as you go out into the world to either get partners or to pitch or to work with a, even a co-host. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have an idea, but ideas aren't protectable. Right. And so one of the mm -hmm. things that's very important to understand, and th you can be talking to other people on your team about this, but they'll say, you know, now it's time to get a lawyer involved because if you're not, if, if your idea is just an idea, the idea of let's do a multi-part series on this true crime situation. There are a zillion of those, that's an idea. Let's, even if you say, let's do it on this one particular unsolved murder case, that's an idea. When you start to write out and what that treatment looks like, how you would, what the arc of the story is, that's when you begin to have something that's protectable and you say, let me get a lawyer to advise me mm -hmm. and perhaps register that with the copyright office so that when I go out into the world, somebody doesn't steal my IP. Do you recommend registering, I mean, the treatments for, for copyright? I mean, how, what, at what point do you do that? Like, what are you actually submitting to the copyright office? Um, you could re absolutely register a treatment. Mm -hmm. Anything, that, it's gotta be sufficiently detailed. I mean, the, you, I am kind of, um, I always recite the statutory definition mm -hmm. of copyright, which is the tangible expression of an idea fixed in a tangible medium. Mm -hmm. So, the unique expression, excuse me, fixed in a tangible medium. So, if it's general, then it's probably, it's not expensive to register something with the copyright office, so it's not like, oh my God, this insurmountable hurdle, it's right. $40 filing fees. Mm -hmm. So it's probably better to err on the side of registering earlier mm -hmm. than, um, than waiting. Got it. And um, 
just to go back to Sam and Vanessa for a second. Now, when you are sitting down with a client who has either an existing podcast or just a great idea that you think could be taken out to market, whether, you know, for, for either a TV show or film or, you know, anything really, a live show, um, what's, what does the process look like? I mean, is it just setting up meetings with, with producers? I mean, what, what, how do you tend to kind of approach um, getting the work out there? You know, my first question always to clients is, like, how do you see this, right? Do you see it as a TV show? Do you see it as a, as a feature? Do you see it as a eight-part book series followed up by a TV show, right? So, so figuring out what their vision is. Second thing is, um, uh, you know, if, if they completely own it outright, then it's a lot easier. Um, if there are life rights involved, a lot of times it's securing those life rights. In addition, that very rarely happens before a podcast is made. I highly encourage all of you to get that before, if you can. Mm -hmm. um, we can go back to that and talk a little later. It just makes the process so much more seamless. Um, but then it's, and then it's also really figuring out how involved do you want to be, right? Like most of my clients don't just want to hand over their work. In fact, all of my clients don't just want to hand over their work and say like, yes, somebody else run with this and take it out into the universe, right? And that's something I really encourage because the people that are the best to work with, the people that excite me the most, the, the, the creators that have drive who are real artists have more than one idea. Um, one idea is not that exciting to work with. It's the people who have a thousand ideas who are gonna be working in this medium forever. And so, you know, uh, uh, if they wanna be executive producers on a project, if they wanna be even a writer on the project, it's definitely possible these days. Um, there is such a desire out in the world right now, especially in television, also in feature, for intellectual property. It is unbelievable. I think the latest numbers I heard that a third of all TV shows right now are based on intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, television executives are fascinated by podcasts. They don't understand this world. <laughs> they really don't. They wanna know how you do what you do. They are so hungry for your ideas. Um, so figuring out who those right partners are. So just to be like really granular, and I hope this is helpful. Please tell me if it is not, because no, um, I wanna be helpful to everyone here. If, if you have a podcast that already exists, whether it has all the episodes are available yet, whether or not they're even produced, if you really believe that it will make a great TV show, like start having those conversations with agents and managers and lawyers as early as possible. We take stuff out all the time that's yeah. in a really, really nascent phase. It does not have to be a giant blockbuster hit yet if it's an original idea. The first step usually for me, my strategy, would be start setting meetings with you, um, with uh, you know, showrunners and production companies. Because if you just sell an idea directly to a network, you start to lose control over it immediately. You want to partner with experienced, fantastic creative producers that you really, really gel with um, that will help to develop it and then go out in the marketplace. And, and those deals, you know, there is some money up front often um, for a production company to option it. You know, it tends to not be a life-changing windfall, don't quit your day job. Mm -hmm. um, but that would really be the first step. And, and, and I have to tell you, like, so many, I would say every single project that I have set up in the last year, um, the producers, the showrunners, desperately want the involvement, the active day-to-day -day involvement of the original creator. That is a position that I don't think we've really ever seen before. It is mm -hmm. such an exciting time. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's really where the process starts. It usually takes, it's usually about like a year, six months to a year to really develop. Um, and, uh, and then from there, just going out and, and selling it to networks, and that includes obviously all the streamers, broadcast networks, cable networks, um, and that's kind of where the process is. Um, if we take that back a step, what about yeah. like people in the audience or people at this conference who are like getting incoming calls about their projects? Because I feel like there is a lot of that yeah. going mm -hmm. on, um, and they might not have representation or access to representation. So what are they like? Can you please? Well, like, everyone walk has them access through? to representation because <laughs> everyone has. Good so, I mean, like podcast producers are the most like wily alley cat people I've yes, ever met in my life. <laughs> you can find anyone. <laughs> everyone in this room has access to representation. Like full stop. I also, but, oh sorry. Oh no, no, I was just, I was just gonna say, so I am very wary of incoming calls because yeah. for me generally, they're not necessarily the best. 
So you want to have as many people like essentially bidding on your project as possible. If you are starting to get incoming calls, it's a great sign that people are connecting with your work, but you should already know at that point people are connecting with your work because you're getting feedback from your audience. Like people who listen to podcasts are so passionate about what they listen to, you're already gonna know. So the incoming calls, the incoming emails are great. File them away, hold on to them, and you know, look for the kind of representation that you want um, and throw those into the mix for sure. Um, you know, and honor, I would definitely say honor that early interest, right? Mm -hmm. Don't cut them out, take those meetings, um, include them in your list of people. It's the right thing to do, it is the nice thing to do. Um, and sometimes that will end up being who you're working with, right? They may be the most passionate about the project. Um, but don't limit yourself ever, ever, ever to just the incoming, uh, the incoming cold calls or emails. Yeah, I think we all know that like if one producer's interested, other producers are exactly. interested. Exactly, it's always the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I'm I, all about maintaining ownership yeah. as yeah. long as you possibly can until the right partner comes along, especially with podcasts. Like you were kind of asking about like what's the earlier process and like what are the earlier steps. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, what are you waiting for? If you wanna do it, do it. It's so easy to start the creation process. Yeah. And then obviously there's advertising and other things that come along, but for the most part, like, people don't want to be pushing a train out of the station. They want to, they want to be trying to jump on a train that is leaving the station. And I think mm -hmm. you as a creator, as a voice, it's your job to be like, this is a great fucking idea. It's happening whether anyone ever gets it or not. Mm -hmm. This train is leaving the station. And people will get on board. That yeah. kind of belief, that kind of like... That energy. This that is happening energy. with or without you. Yeah, that yeah. blind optimism, like... There's something like magical about that and producers will find you and the truth is the reps will find you too. Like mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. prowling for people because <laughs> yeah. our job doesn't exist without people creating things. So for me, like I'm like, if you're doing this thing, protect it as long as you possibly can mm -hmm. until it's like really, okay, we're really ready to go to the next step and I'm, this person adds so much value because I've created so much value that that I'm not giving up something for nothing. I think sometimes when you're starting out, you, you're like so myopic and you're at home and you think that nobody sees you, and especially with podcasts, because it's something you do in a room alone, that sometimes when you get attention, it feels like, <gasps> and it's mm -hmm. like, no, they know, don't worry mm. about it. Follow that gut, follow that guide, like keep creating, that's all that matters. And then, um, and then once you've taken, the, say you've like taken something out, you've sold it, it's set up somewhere. Um, Lisa, do you mind just walking us through kind of the like d major deal points? We've talked a little bit about IP, but mm -hmm. you know, all the other points, because we hear IP, 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 but what else should people be keeping in mind to protect themselves? Well, I think the, the main thing is, how are you gonna ultimately get paid once you have this partner? <laughs> so that is, the, that is the be all and end all. So are you, um, are you splitting ad revenue? Are, is someone just trying to pay you a fee? Um, are they trying to acquire all of your IP um, and then just tie you to ancillaries? I mean, I would echo what Vanessa said that everybody is looking to have the original creators connected, but what you want is a guarantee that you're attached to everything and you're getting half of what they're getting at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, if they're doing a television project or a film project or something else, maybe a stage play, mm -hmm. who knows? Um, and then there's uh, the issue about what rights you reserve for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you might want to reserve those stage rights, um, print publication rights. You know, if people are journalists or writers, there might be a book that you might want to do. And so it's really about how the rights are divided and how the money is divided. Those mm -hmm. are the key things. Um, and then also talk to them about what budget they're going to um, commit to this. Because again, if you've been producing a podcast and you've already figured out how to get that podcast mm -hmm. up and you've been paying for it, you know, what are they bringing to the table? This is the whole issue in picking partners. What are they bringing to the table? How much additional revenue? Mm -hmm. What kind of sales team that they, do they have? How are they going to be marketing it? Or how are they going to build your audience? If you're giving up a piece of your potential revenue, how much are they going to bring in? If they have a network so that the ad sales are gonna be significant, then maybe it's worth it. If it's just somebody that doesn't really have that reach, you have to really push hard and think long and hard about how much you're gonna give up. 
So that, I mean, we've talked a little about like sort of TV and film, but mm -hmm. just to like take a step back and maybe people who are earlier in the cycle of like podcast creation, like if you have a great idea and you're taking, you if you have a client who has a great idea and they're taking it out to podcast networks, mm -hmm. what are the, um, what are the deal terms you look for? Like what are the, what are the deal breakers? What are the, you know, as far as like IP ownership, as far as like ancillary, right? Like what do you, what do you think everyone should be looking for? I think everybody should be looking for, it's what's the revenue split? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, you may not be thinking about ancillaries yet, mm -hmm. but so, you know, if somebody is acquiring content, they're either going to get more subscribers mm -hmm. to their service or they're going to sell more ads. Mm -hmm. And so you should be, if your content drives either one of those, you mm -hmm. should be participating in one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, it depends on what their model is. Yeah. You know, whether is it an audience metric that you get a bonus? You know, how is do you it measure ad that? revenue? Yeah. Do you, are you just splitting it? And then how about, I mean, ownership of RSS feed, we've talked about, right. um, I think people pretty much I mean, know about and that. And these days people are really, um, you know, when you're doing these big deals, they're trying not to let you own the RSS feed. That's really starting to go away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a real issue about you're losing direct control of your audience, right. uh, access to it. So that's, again, you want to make sure that whoever you're partnering with is big enough that it's worth possibly forfeiting some of that control. You had also mentioned um, budget, because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of creators and producers you're hearing from um, from people, okay, you know, make cereal, but make it for $12. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you, like to talk up front about budget and schedule and all that stuff. So maybe you could outline that a little bit. Sure. I mean, the issue is how many episodes, I mean, one, how many episodes are you doing currently? How many episodes is whoever the partner is committing to? Because if it's going to be significantly fewer than you're doing because they're spending more, does that make your audience start to lose interest because they're not getting the frequency? If it's more, you have to think about the workload. I mean, most podcasters that I work with, it's one of their five different hats that they wear and five mm -hmm. different jobs that they do. So what you don't want to do is walk into a situation where they're saying, okay, you're going to split the ad revenue, but you're going to be working like crazy, mm -hmm. and it's going to you know, take time away from the other things that are, are generating you know, the money you need to pay your mortgage. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing you have to balance and, and take a look at. My last question for you about the granular kind of uh, deal-making structure stuff is, is paywalls. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. So can we talk about paywalls a little bit? Because I've heard a lot of a lot of, of people. <laughs> a lot of a lot. Uh, a lot of a lot <laughs> about a lot. paywalls. So I'm just going to let you go off. Well, <laughs> I won't go off. I mean, I'm aware of where we are. Yeah. And, you know, anyway. What I, what I will say about paywalls is, again, I think it really depends on how mature your podcast is right. and how habituated your audience is to going and getting your content for free. Right. Because it's, you know, if you're behind, if you're with a company that's behind a paywall, okay, there's upfront money, mm -hmm. but what does the back end look like? And if there are bonuses that are based on right. audience, if your audience drops off because people are not used to paying a subscription right. for your content, the, the upfront money may be all that you see. Right. And so, Access you know, I, first. I've yeah. seen clients say, you know, that looks like it's appealing, but actually mm -hmm. they, I don't want to do that. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, a question for Vanessa and Sam, um, back to kind of like entertainment world, is do you see people coming to you with podcasts with the like, I mean, Podcasting is a lot of work. <laughs> it's yeah, a big yes, commitment. It you yeah. have to make a lot of episodes and really court a listenership and market the crap out of it. Um, but I feel like there are certainly people coming to you with stars in their eyes focused more on the touring and the TV ideas. And what do you say to, to them? Yes. <laughs> I say yes. I say do it. Look, multiple revenue streams for, for any creative idea is always a fantastic thing, right? So a lot of the areas that we cover with, with our podcast clients are live tours, books, and then ancillary rights, obviously, for television and film. And as Lisa mentioned, obviously, um, stage rights, um, which can be uh, very significant and very exciting. And we try to carve out all of those things and, and maintain ownership for our clients in all of them. Um, 
but I mean, is your is your question about the um, uh, like like what like we're what looking is your for advice when someone comes to you with kind of a podcast that is still emerging? Oh, I mean, we can go out. I mean, I've sold podcasts for scripted television um, before a single episode has been produced. Wow. Um, Full, wow. I mean, really and truly, off of of a ten minute, uh, off of a, a, a like a literally a ten minute um, audio segment of what would have been, you know, a fifty minute episode. Um, if there is an amazing idea, and this is why I say really and truly, like your podcast, you it does not need to be like the number one podcast on iTunes. Which, like, what does that even mean? But. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it really doesn't. If it's a really fantastic idea, um, if it's something that's like super sellable in television, like we, like we will tell you what that is. Um, and it, it can be super early stages. I, and, and really and truly, there's, um, there, there just are no rules right now. Um, it, it, there needs to be something there. Like you need to have scripts if it's a, if it's a fiction podcast. You need to know what the episode breakdown is gonna be. You, know, you need to kind of know like what is the payoff, right? Where, where is this story going? What is it really about? But it does not have to be totally done. Um, that said, if you think, if we think as a team that it could end up being a huge hit and that would be a point of leverage, we then may wait, um, which I've also done before, um, uh, for something to debut to kind of build that feeling in the marketplace that it is super competitive, that it is, like Sam said, that train that is leaving the station and somebody, you get to jump on or not, but it's leaving without you. Um, so it really just depends, but I think it goes back to the first question that we all talked about, which is like, when do you start working with representation? And I think why we say earlier is better because of that. So we can kind of work with you strategically to build, um, uh, uh, to build kind of like the best marketplace environment for you to take uh, your project out. Okay. Do you, would you have any, I mean, that's, Surprising and amazing to hear. I didn't realize you were selling podcasts before anyone's even listened to them. Yes. <laughs> That's new to me. That's incredible. You need an audience for touring, though. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. No, no that's, a, yes. that's a very, yeah. very good point. And then I guess I just wonder what your specific advice is for certain genres. Because, yes, we've seen a lot of reported pieces get... Um, get attention, but then now there are more scripted pieces coming out. Are, do you have different advice for like, whether it's like a comedy podcast or like a scripted podcast, what are you seeing um, there is a hunger for? And is there like different advice according to like different genres? I mean, generally speaking, the most sellable stuff for television and for feature is highly produced narrative podcasts really, really hard to do interview-based podcasts as a TV show. I mean, maybe as non-scripted, but I, I do more scripted. Um, and uh, comedy is tricky. Comedy is very tricky um, as IP. I don't really understand why that is, but it's just a fact right now. Um, and so anything, if it's a, a scripted podcast, so like fiction um, or, or nonfiction stories, um, those are definitely the most sellable. Mm -hmm. yeah. But touring, I would think, Sam, I don't do touring. I mean, yeah. CAA does touring. I work with my, my, my touring colleagues, so I don't do yeah, that. Yeah, comedy mm -hmm. is great for touring, yeah. Yeah. but you have to have an audience. So mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. is like, you know, I think, uh, I feel like all of my answers are basically the same, but it is no, like creative helpful. forward, creative first. Like you have to be love, you have to love this idea more than anyone and be willing to do it and keep doing it because your audience will find you if you're committed to it. But yeah, definitely for sure, scripted narrative and unscripted kind of narrative. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, why do you think, I know that you like to have these long conversations and we have had long conversations <laughs> about comedy. Why do you think comedy is tricky for adaptation? Because do you mean like comedy scripted or do you mean like interview? Either or. Well, I think... Well, interview doesn't have an inherent narrative engine. Yes. So, like, what what am I seeing other than this funny person talking to another funny person? Um, what about people who want a late night show or, like, uh, you know? I mean, I, yeah. I guess unscripted. What are the that, opportunities then that's not out based, there? That tends to not be based on IP, really. Yeah. Or at least it so far it's hasn't. mostly personality-based. Yeah. Right, right, right. Like, they're looking for famous people, mm -hmm. quite frankly. People mm -hmm. with or people with like a huge social media mm -hmm. following or people that have built up their business in another sort of way. Right. There are, listen, there are the, mar 
there is Mark Maron. I don't know mm -hmm. how many Mark Marons there are. Right. Um, but like Mark Maron exists and he, you know, it's funny because he had been a stand-up comedian for years and was the most bitter, angry, like frustrated. <laughs> um, nice I, I worked with Mark when he was going through his first divorce. I cannot <laughs> so, imagine. He's an amazing, we worked at Air America together. He's, he's an amazing like a person. Lovely but human. he worked really hard yeah. to build up his radio yeah. skills and he's incredible. Incredible at it. Incredible. Incredible and he it. also, it's funny because he turned to podcasts because he was like, fuck this fucking business. Yeah. And like, there was yeah. like, I think he was saying that for 20 years before yeah. he started the podcast. Yeah, like there was like a real honesty to the WTF. It wasn't like, this is the way in. He right. was like, really broke down the barriers and wanted but to But also honest. had an amazing producer, a guy named Brendan McDonald, who is yes. an incredible producer, helped him craft that show, is still with him, has been with him mm -hmm. since Air America, so 2004. Mm. Um, so producing talent. Also. Yes, um, but I guess to my point is that like not a lot of people are going to be a Mark Marin, right? And also a lot of comedians that are doing podcasts are also supporting it with working on acting and touring mm -hmm. and they're doing stand-up and there's like a lot of other avenues by which they're getting known right. rather than just through podcasts. So it, it is trickier right, that right, way. Right. Lisa, would you say the same? You're seeing mostly like narrative fiction deals um yes not for kind sure. of unscripted interesting yeah definitely not mm -hmm. unscripted unless you know there are people as mm -hmm. sam and vanessa were saying that have other profiles mm -hmm. i have clients that are stand-up comedians that mm -hmm. are touring and also have a podcast or people who are right. motivational speakers and bloggers who also have a podcast and then their touring tends to be um very successful because they have a profile somewhere else but i haven't seen those kinds of shows um, turn into right. film or television deals. I also oh, think that, like, late, just in general, like, aside from podcasts, trying to get a late night show off the ground is right. so yeah. hard. Yeah, I mean, there are only so many slots, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, can we, sorry, I have to, like, wrap this up in a little bit, but I did want to ask you guys a little bit about pitching, pitching both podcast networks and then pitching TV um, eventually. What is, like, what are the sort of elements of a pitch? What are, like, do's and do nots? Like, if you could walk through that um, a little bit, what does a pitch look like? A pitch, uh, like a, a pitch for a podcast or a pitch for TV? I mean, both would be great. Um, I'll speak to pitch for TV if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, so for pitch for TV, first of all, um, it, is, it, is a, it is a long and laborious process to figure out how to develop something for TV. It really <laughs> is. It, 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 this is why you want to work with the best producers, the best production companies, the people who know how to develop, who have in mind... Um, exactly what the show is, who know exactly where they're going to take it, um, who have the best relationships with the executives at those networks, having those targets in mind and then really crafting it, right? So it is, I would say it's not that much different from, you know, uh, uh, you know how you sort of conceive of the podcast. It's where is it going? Who are the characters? What is going to keep people, you know, tuning in over and over and over? Um, what is that internal narrative engine? Um, what is exciting and different about it? Um, a lot of what's selling in TV right now is a lot of like genre blending, right? So think of like Succession, right? It's a one hour drama. It's also the funniest comedy on TV. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that like that, that blending, right? Um, but you know, we don't have to spend too much time on like what's selling in the TV marketplace, but um, in order to prepare for a pitch, there are you know, extensive materials that are put together. The production company will do that. I, I think for people who are sitting here today um, who are thinking that their, that their show might be a good TV show, I wouldn't worry too much about how to put your pitch together because that's really what a seasoned television Producer, production company yeah. is going to do with you and do for you. Don't self-edit and not try and go make it into television mm -hmm. if you are not sure how to pitch it. You are, you not, are not supposed to know how to pitch it. You yeah. know, that it is not your responsibility necessarily. You'll know the story forward and back that you want to tell, um, but that's why it's so key to find those, find those good partners who know how to do this, who have a proven track record of selling. I would also add, though, having been a TV and film producer and now being on the network buying side, um, people who develop podcasts, they're very similar to TV pitches. Mm -hmm. You've totally. worked out, you Absolutely. know, like so many years of like the narrative that, Absolutely. you know, it's just about someone kind of massaging it into place. So also have faith in what you've already done. Yeah. You've already plotted it all out. But figuring out how it could live for 10 seasons because yeah. that would mm -hmm. be the goal, right? Um, and, you know, how, how, would, how would you maybe incorporate visuals, right? All that mm -hmm. stuff. But, I, I, you know, 
work with your collaborators on that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much at this stage. Great, thanks guys. Thanks so much for your time. And we can open it up to questions now. I think there are two mics. There's a mic on that side and a mic on that side. If you want to um, ask any questions, you can come up to the front. Where are they? Oh, there's one right there and there's one right there. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I have a question. Hi. So you guys have been mostly talking about if you're an independent producer. And I'm wondering if, what advice you have for people who are employees, mm -hmm. who I know, like I'm an employee of a public radio station. I've read the employee handbook. Mm -hmm. I know they own my intellectual property. Mm -hmm. But if I'm creating a podcast that I think has potential for TV adaptation or movies, like what advice do you have? So <laughs> let, let me speak directly to that. Yeah. So the advice that I give folks that are working for companies is the work for hire language typically only covers what you are doing in the course of your employment. So hmm. now if your job is to produce podcasts for public radio, then yeah, they, but you can also potentially go to them and say, I want to carve this out. It depends on what you're producing. And you know, if, for example, you're producing true crime and your idea is not a true crime, but something really far afield of what you're doing in your day job, you might be able to approach them. But the thing that I always tell clients is that the work for hire language covers what is done in the course of your employment related to your job. So is that helpful? That's a good question. <laughs> that, that was like, well, that, that's the, the law. Does, so you does that answer the question? Well, I guess my question was a show I'm making for. So you're already employee. doing it for yeah. them. Oh, they own it probably. They own it. They'll, they'll own they it. own it. But, 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 but depending but you on your could, relationship with them, I mean, you could go they, and need, they, yeah, go. they may be very supportive, like especially if you're hosting it and not just, not just producing it. They may be, may be very supportive of, you know, having you be a part of those conversations yeah. if there is some sort of ancillary um, business Excellent. to be right. done. It's, that's why I'm saying you could go to them and try to carve certain things out or say, you know, it's a renegotiation of your employment agreement because mm. right now you may be on salary, but if you're saying, look, I've created something that's really got value, I should have a piece of that income stream. And if you have and a representative a too, I would just say <laughs> part of, of what we would do is, you know, if, if that podcast was then going out um, into the marketplace and you were, and, and, and you know, your employer maybe was leading the conversations with different production companies, part of what we would be saying to those production companies is you are going to want the original creator mm -hmm. involved yeah. as an executive producer and a consultant and get fees, right, right for those things um, and, you know, get maybe some sort of individual lump sum outside of what your employer is getting. Um, and all those things are totally possible. Should we over here? Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question about agenting and maybe managing as well, actually. It might be for both of you guys. Um, I am new to podcasting, and I have uh, 20 years of experience as a writer, a fiction writer. So I'm really familiar with what agenting looks like in the book world. And I know you guys have mentioned, you know, maybe your podcast also has a book or something like that. And that's something I'm thinking about a lot with my project. And so I'm wondering, as I'm early in this project... Um, knowing that down the road in the next couple of years there will be a book as well as the podcast. Um, what it, I mean, you're all saying get you know representation early, but also um, what does that look like, agent versus managing? And at this point, and when I'm just at the beginning of this process, what should I be thinking about? Oh, and also, is there is there overlap here? Like, do you do you all also represent books, and is that like very common in the Agent team world so with podcasting. So CA does have a have a books department. Mm -hmm. um, I also sit in our books group, which does um, books to TV and film, um, and then we are uh, 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 representing those rights for books that CAA represents, and also we work very closely with our uh, uh, co agents, so so literary agents, um, to uh, represent you know books to the best of our ability. Um, uh, and you know, it can, it, it's both, I guess, is the answer. You know, I personally don't, um, uh, sell books to publishers. Um, and so we use our, our, uh, our book agents to do that. Managers and agents also work together, yeah. right? So like everybody I represent also has an agent, um, and agencies like CAA, WME, UTA, they all have a bunch of different departments. There's a book department, a touring department, a theatrical department, a like 
a TV lit department, a, a feature lit department, right? So there's a ton of people covering a ton of different territories and that's why being at an agency like that is so great is because whatever you wanna do, like you'll have your point person who will kind mm -hmm. of run point for, like they're your quarterback. I don't know much about sports, but it makes <laughs> sense to me. Um, uh, like they're your quarterback right. inside the agency helping you navigate all those areas. Whereas, um, like my company is very small. I represent 12 people. Um, I'm kind of more day to day, more hands on. Um, a lot of agents are very, very hands on. I just happen to have more time because I only have 12 people. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's necessarily like go find representation as soon as possible. I think it's like if somebody is interested, if you meet someone you click with, like work with them. It's, it doesn't hurt to have representation as early as possible, but also like don't settle. If, you, if somebody comes, Definitely. approaches you and you're like, this doesn't feel mm -hmm. like the right fit, like don't do it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. If we go back over here, I think we have time for you guys, yeah. Hi, so could you explain, you mentioned uh, pitching TV, but pitching a podcast idea to a podcast network, assuming you, you've taken the steps to retain as much intellectual property as you can and not yet having representation. What is that process, or would you even recommend it doing that without representation? You definitely can do it without representation. Every company's a little bit different. So I work with uh, uh, Gimlet Media. They uh, really prefer you to come in with it, the idea as nascent a point as possible mm -hmm. um, because they have so many great producers that can help sort of develop it. Um, in sort of the vision that they have being sort of, you know, the HBO of podcasting, right? Um, every company is a little bit different. A lot of others may want you to come in with the idea sort of with, you know, cut out a whole cloth. Um, and then I would say, you know, you may have, at certain companies, you may have more leverage to maintain ownership if, for example, you already have some of the audio. Um, if mm -hmm. you've already done some interviews, if, um, you know, you have, if you are basically like delivering them, you know, here are the eight episodes, here are the 10 episodes, it's exactly um, gonna be this, I already know how it's gonna happen, I already mm -hmm. have some of my scripts done, um, you may be able to sort of maintain more, more ownership at that point. I mean, at, at Erios, I know that we love a like paragraph telling us what the show is and then audio would be, is great, but if not, then we can work together to, you know, uh, come up with a pilot. But, um, but really just the idea, you know, that's what we're content first, so it's really about the idea always. I always think of it as like if you're shopping for books when you read the back of the book, like to tell you what it yeah. is. Like, yeah. Just like that, basically. That's a good point. All right, last question. Hi. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa was my agent at CA. Aww. She's great. Hi, Jamie. Hi, babe. <laughs> um, I have a question for Lisa. Yeah. So my business partner and I just um, launched last week a scripted fiction podcast studio, mm -hmm. much like a film and television studio. So IP is our business model, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and everything that we do will have a pipeline to film and television because I come from the film and television world, as does my partner. Mm -hmm. Our question is, what upfront fees and back ends do you think are fair to offer in the scripted fiction space for creators? Mm -hmm in return for ownership, because it's a very different space for them. Like when I sell a movie to Universal, Universal <laughs> owns that movie. They can change it, they can do whatever they want with it. I've now sold it. So before I answer your question, what's the name of your company? Because I'm doing a deal like this right now and I have a feeling you might be the person on the other side. <laughs> um, well, we literally, our Hollywood reporter just announced us last week, so it's not us, but we're Summer Audio. Oh, okay, so it's not you. Um, <laughs> So it depends. I mean, I think if your main business model is to, um, to go to film and television, then you should be off offering film and television-like numbers mm -hmm. because otherwise mm -hmm. you're trying to get you know, content that can, gener that can um, garner those kind of fees for your company at cut rate prices. So I think you have to offer the same, um, the same kind of numbers you would offer to somebody if they were coming in to write a pilot or you know, write a treatment for you for television. I mean, somewhat discounted, but not a whole lot. Right, and then with, with that, are you also, would you also advise your clients to push for, I know what Vanessa would do, for push for <laughs> producer credits Ab and things like that? Absolutely. Absolutely, Absolutely. Absolutely. because you guys have the expertise and the connections, but my clients tend to be the people with the ideas that are doing the writing, and they, they should be locked for life, they should be producers, you know, if they're writers, they should be writing EPs potentially yeah. rather than non-writing EPs. So yes, I would be t um, pushing for all of that. Okay, thanks. 
Sure. Thanks, everyone. I think that's, oh. Sorry, is there a question for Paul? I, it, and until we get cut off, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got so excited, I almost for, I forgot what my question was. Um, oh, God. It was this, a is, this is a nightmare. This is <laughs> like a totally nightmare with you. Un, in underpants thing. It was a follow-up to her question, question and you said so, compensation. Yes. Um, <laughs> and oh my god, I'm sorry. I'm going to sit down because I might remember it in a second if I'm not facing you. You can sorry. email us. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank for joining guys. us. <laughs>